You're listening to the Unspeakable Podcast with Megan Daum. Now on Podcast One. Hi, I'm Frank. I don't like change. And I just saw a billboard for this new BJ's Wholesale Club talking about up to 25% off grocery store prices. Oh, really? What's wrong with paying full price, huh? No, sir. I would not join BJ's Wholesale Club. Let's agree to disagree, Frank. Say you do want to sign up now to get a $40 BJ's digital gift card. Join the new BJ's Wholesale Club, opening soon in Ross Township. Visit BJ's.com slash Ross Township or the BJ's Membership Center at the Block Northway. Offer valid for a limited time. If you're struggling with alcohol or drugs, Recovery Centers of America can help. RCA's local inpatient and outpatient programs are founded on science and delivered with heart from an expert caring team who will inspire and guide you every step of the way. Call 1-888-RECOVERY now to speak with a treatment advisor. At RCA, you'll be in a community that builds connections and fosters support from peers and RCA's team of medical professionals and recovery support specialists. At RCA's state-of-the-art campus, in Monroeville, Pennsylvania, they tailor your treatment to you and also offer specialized programs like PRIZE, a unique program for people who have been in recovery but have relapsed. Here, you won't have to start from step one. You'll build off the knowledge you've previously acquired in treatment and focus on the areas of your recovery that need improvement. RCA answers the phone and accepts patients 24-7 and is in network with most major insurance providers. Don't wait. Call 1-888-RECOVERY today. That's 1-888-RECOVERY. People and corporations are highly risk averse, right? And there's just no, there's no incentive to uh, step out of line when the, the consequences can be that painful, right? There's no individual incentive to say, hey, listen, guys, it's, um, you know, everything you think you know about the cops and violence is wrong. You know, when you have people literally weeping over the footage they just saw of George Floyd being killed, right? So it's like, like, like that's it, it never get it never gets truly easy to do that, uh, even though many people can recognize that they they're being swept up into a a kind of public hysteria and moral panic. Welcome to the Unspeakable Podcast. I'm your host, Megan Daum. If you're a fan of this show, my guest may need no or at least very little introduction. Sam Harris is a giant in the world of podcasting, particularly podcasts that do what I try to do here, which is grapple with complex or sensitive topics with intelligence, curiosity, and ample time. Now, there's a line I thought up a couple of years ago that I've been known to repeat, and it goes like this. If the smart, thoughtful people aren't willing to stick their necks out and talk about tricky subjects, the stupid, thoughtless people are happy to do the job. I think Sam is a case study in the kind of smart, thoughtful person I'm talking about, and that he's having these conversations in a way that's suitably provocative, but also ethical and respectful of his guests and audience alike. If you're not familiar with Sam, you can check out his podcast, Making Sense, which originated in 2013 under the name Waking Up. A prominent voice in what's been somewhat loosely defined as the new atheist movement, Sam is the author of several best-selling books about subjects related to religion and moral belief systems, including The End of Faith and The Moral Landscape. He's trained as a neuroscientist and a philosopher. And in addition to being known for robust public disagreements with other prominent thinkers, he has a whole side hustle in the world of meditation. He's practiced meditation for more than 30 years and has a meditation app, Waking Up with Sam Harris. As long as this interview is, we did not talk about meditation, a practice in which I am woefully unpracticed, or religion, really, for that matter. But we do share many areas of interest some of which we talked about when I was a guest on Sam's podcast back in 2019, talking about my book, The Problem With Everything. I asked Sam to come on The Unspeakable because I wanted to revisit some of those free speech and culture war issues, but even more so because I wanted to ask him about something that I think of as a real casualty of spending a lot of time thinking about these topics which is that it can become hard to just have a normal conversation 
with someone who isn't as deep in the weeds as we are. I call this problem the problem of how not to ruin the dinner party. And I wanted to ask Sam's advice about that, though, as you'll hear, he sometimes goes to different sorts of dinner parties than I do. I also want to say that we recorded this conversation back in mid-July. I've been waiting to post it for a variety of reasons. And in the time since, Sam has gotten into a rather high-profile disagreement with another prominent podcaster, the evolutionary biologist Brett Weinstein, uh, over COVID vaccines. And if I'm summing this up correctly, the way Brett, along with his wife, Heather Hying, who's also an evolutionary biologist, are talking about potential risk factors and also potential treatments for COVID. Um, at the time of my discussion with Sam, this issue was starting to bubble up, and we talked about it for um, a little bit of time, although, frankly, I'm not even sure that I was uh, summing up the uh, the disagreement adequately or, or correctly. Um, I was still trying to get my mind around it, and frankly, I, I still am. Anyway, if you've been following this controversy, that part of the interview might sound like old news to you. I considered taking it out, especially because this is a long interview anyway, but I ultimately kept it in because I think there might be enough listeners for whom this subject is new and perhaps they'll want to dig in on their own. Besides, I am scheduled to interview Brett and Heather myself in a few weeks, at which point I guess everyone will be caught up on this late summer tempest in a podcasting teapot. Okay, and one tiny last thing. Uh, at one point in this conversation, I say mass interpretation when I mean misinterpretation. It's obvious what I mean, but it's also the kind of thing that keeps me up at night if I don't clarify, which may speak to the same kind of temperament that causes me to ruin dinner parties. At any rate, here's my talk with Sam Harris. Sam Harris, welcome to the Unspeakable Podcast. Thanks, Megan. Happy to be here. I want to start just by saying how much I appreciate, not just you're taking the time to talk with me today, obviously, but how much I appreciate the way you've handled your own podcast and just your position in the world of ideas and open discussion. It feels kind of poignant to be talking with you right now because it's almost a year to the date that I started this podcast. And uh, when I was figuring out how to put it together and kind of find the right register for it, you were a real model. I have to say, you know, you don't have screaming YouTube clips promoting the show, at least not that I've seen. Right, uh, right. You know, you just have calm, dignified adult conversations. So uh, I just want to thank you for being a beacon there. Oh, nice. Nice. Well, welcome to the the podcasting game. There's only <laughs> only a million plus of us yeah, at this point. It's yeah, amazing. not enough. Always, always, yeah. you know, more the merrier. Um, so I guess what I want to talk about first, um, and forgive me, if this is a long winded opening question, uh, but you know, I, I want to kind of get at this impulse that I think a lot of us, uh, this impulse that I've started to think of as intellectual nitpicking for lack of a better term. I, I think a lot of us in this space in this heterodox space, whatever you want to call it, you know, we find ourselves burrowing into subjects much more intensely than most people do. You know, we get really excited about looking at issues honestly and understanding what's really going on. But, you know, the, the reality is that most people, even the most educated, politically, socially engaged people, don't go through life like that, right? You know, most of our day-to-day -day friends are going to have a certain set of assumptions about the world that they don't really care to dismantle. So my question for you, and I, I think you might be uniquely qualified to address this because so much of it has to do with mindfulness, is how do you balance your own need to be talking about things in the right way with a kind of social obligation, or, or maybe it's even just good manners, not mm -hmm. to derail every conversation because you can't resist telling people what they're overlooking. Yeah. Well, yeah, unfortunately, I, I don't think I can recommend a general heuristic or, or um, rule to follow here. It's, it's just, you, you sort of, you have to pick your battles. You have to be aware of um, the different variables that that make it seem more or less likely that a a conversation about the issues and in this case often polarizing issues will converge on something useful right that there'll be you know there's there's some 
there's something to be gained from actually getting into the weeds, you know, with, with people, whether you're, you know, at a dinner party or you've overheard somebody say something or I mean, like, just, you know, just, are you, just how, how much of an appetite do you have to, to turn to the person you know, talking to their, their friend in an elevator and say, you know, you're wrong about this. And, you know, I'm only 18 inches away. Depends on uh, what floor you're on and right, how far exactly. you're going up in the <clears throat> elevator. So, you know, I've, I've learned to pick my battles more. I think, I think I'm, if anything, there's, there's a fairly linear path to being more conservative about this or more, more jaded or more, you know, just less hopeful that it's worth the effort in, in private, I mean, in, in conversations where you're, this is not, you know, obviously your job to, to be disabusing someone of their cherished opinions. Um, but when it is your job and when you're on a podcast or, um, when you're uh, in some way, I mean, the, the, the truth is there are some dinner parties that invoke the, the job description more than, more than, um, you know, just a, just the uh, any normal social encounter might seem to. I mean, there, there, you know, there are certainly dinner parties that I wind up at where I'm there to be. It, I'm, I'm probably expected to be more of my public, you know, oh. podcasting self than I'm. I'm expected to be just a, a person who doesn't want to get into it. Right? They so, brought you in as a sort of conversational ringer. Yeah, or what, no whether it's you know whether the you know I, I was you know quote brought in in any way. It's just I, given not the nature of, of the course, crowd, yes. you know, it's like I, I'm not the I'm not the I'm not the entertainment at the, at the dinner party, but you know, given who's there and ha, you know how much I I I do I, I know people or, or don't know people and who they are and what their public you know personas are. I mean, sometimes I feel an obligation to not give an inch on anything just because it. You know the, the the people who could be influenced in the conversation uh, have you know, have a lot of influence in the world, right? So it it matters to you know get, that some CEO or or uh, public personality is confused on this particular topic, right? So then I'm I'm not going to shut up, or, you know. So it's it's um there 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 are many variables to consider here, but I do think there's there's uh, a lot of um, scope for civility and and there's certainly you know uh, you know more or less universal scope for kindness and um, yeah I mean if you're just badgering somebody and there's to, to no good end you, you want to recognize that sooner rather than later and and the truth is I, I even on my own podcast I've become more conservative you know I, it used to be that used to be that I was willing to just go into the ditch with anyone. And I mean, you can hear my, my first conversation with Jordan Peterson, right? It was just a disaster. Mm -hmm. It was like, you know, it, it just a harrowing two hours of us disagreeing about the concept <laughs> of truth. And I mean, some people loved it, but most people just thought, holy shit, that was a, uh, just, a, that was just excruciating. Oh, I don't remember uh, it that way. Okay. That's, yeah. That's so, interesting. so like I, you know, it's not that I'll, that'll never happen again, but it's, a, a little of that goes a long way, and if every podcast were like that, it, it just it's just too it's too dispiriting somehow. Because what what almost never happens is uh, you never have someone change their mind in real time on some fundamental point and have the you know the the rays of sunlight you know f just flood into the conversation. It, it just people dig in. If anything, they, they change their mind in private, you know, after the fact, um, and it's um, it just becomes a a kind of commercial for the limitations of conversation and the, and and the impossibility of persuasion when people have um, a lot of a lot invested in a specific point. And I mean, I strive within my own you know, mind at least to not be that sort of person. And if somebody is, is actually making great points that are running counter to something I, I really think I, I understand, you know, I, I want to be as quick as possible to recognize that. And I, I certainly don't want to, to resist that for, you know, uh, you know, minutes and hours at a time uh, in front of an audience, because, you know, it's, it's just, 
Uh, I mean, that's, well, they'll, they'll it, come back and badger you about it. The you're not going to get it past the audience. They're going to they always yeah, say, it, "Why didn't you push back?" It's also, it, 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 you know, if you're actually wrong and the person you're disagreeing with is pointing that out, and the audience can see it, you know, it's just that's that's what it is to be stupid in that context, right? I mean, you're just not you're just not getting it, right? And so you you want to. You, you want to update your your view of the world as quickly as the facts and the the logic of a good argument demand and and so if you, if you can really be fast if you I mean, if you if you can if you can change your mind with um, without uh, any any sign of inertia right then the truth is it, then you're not even you're, it's not it's not even a matter of losing a debate it's just uh you you're you're just conceding a good point and then, well, then okay what, what's the next point sort of give i mean there's it needs to be a kind of fluidity to any given exchange you know i mean on this subject of debates i was going to get to this later but since we're on it now you know you're someone who's participated in a lot of debates i mean obviously you're a huge figure in the new atheism movement and you debated a lot of people about religious topics You've, you know, you just said you made people like Jordan Peterson, Ezra Klein. I mean, I've become lately just more curious about the whole construct of debating. You know, I don't know if that's because something has changed in the last couple of years, but I find it less and less productive. I mean, for instance, you know, people, especially with my last book, people would say, well, why don't you debate like another you know, a, a feminist journalist and you can have it out. Like, why don't you and Rebecca Traster sit down and have a debate? And, you know, I was resistant to it. And at first I thought, well, I'm just, I'm just being a coward. And there's probably some truth to that. But like the more and more, I just feel like uh, somebody like Rebecca Traster and I, I don't mean to pick on her. She's just coming to mind at the moment. We don't actually disagree on that much. There's probably like, you know, 80% we agree on. And there's like 20% where we disagree on maybe root causes and what to do about this thing, whatever the problem is. And I don't know why, I, I feel like just having a discussion where we talked and had a normal sort of back and forth conversation and the stakes somehow didn't seem quite as as immense or volatile is just, is just much more organic to the nature of the way people think and talk. But um, I, I guess like there's still this impulse in the culture and in, in, in media, you know, to say to someone, you know, come debate me. No, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. My appetite for debate, you know, certainly formal debate, has gone way down because it's it's not it's not intellectually honest, really. I mean, it is. It's more right. of a performance. It's you're not, you, you know, Yes. The, you know, the parties show up knowing they're not going to change their minds, so it's not really an effort to persuade the person you're speaking with. And I mean, the truth is, I, I've never engaged formal debate in that spirit, but. It is just it, it, given given the artifice of of what it is, that's more or less what you're guaranteed to get. I mean, it's just, it's just you, you have two people talking to their respective audiences, and it's not that it's useless. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's to see a great debate can be thrilling, and it can it, it can change the minds of people in the audience. But it's almost you know, the, the changing the mind of the person you're talking to is really is not a possibility that is that is on the table. Well, they're not the allowed part. to change their mind. That's would violate yeah. the rules of debate. Yeah. I mean, that's, that would, that's synonymous with losing the debate. Right? <laughs> that's so, right. That's right. So you're trying, you know, this is a tennis match and you're trying to get the ball over the net in the right direction. And if you start, you know, if you, if you jump on the other side of the court and start sending the ball over in the, in, you know, in your opponent's direction, you know, you're not playing the game. So, um, yeah, I, I don't. So it's been many years since I've had anything like a formal debate. I've, I've had some very difficult conversations, some of which have been uh, occasioned by you know, something ugly happening on social media. You know, you know where you know, I've collided with someone on social media and that invited them on the podcast to do an autopsy on on our differences. And so these have been every bit as adversarial as formal debates, but they just, they don't have a, a formal debate structure. And, I, and, I, and I've certainly entered into these conversations hoping for some kind of convergence and occasionally that happens. But in certain cases, it's it's just, the it, it's really been an unrewarding 
exercise. And um, you mentioned Rebecca Traister. Uh, you know, she's been on my podcast, and I remember. Yeah, yeah. We, you know, we, p- people found that exchange. Uh, certainly, many people did. Uh, they found it somewhat excruciating. They, the, the truth is, it was actually it was actually worse than I aired. I mean, in that case, this is one of the rare cases. I usually don't edit much for content, but this is one of these rare cases where I it, we got off on the wrong foot, and I, I said, Rebecca, this is just you know. There's no point in us airing what just happened for the last half hour. Uh, it's just, you know, it, it doesn't, it, all it is going to uh, spread in the world is a sense that conversation is fucking impossible, right? So let's let's just, let's see if we can restart here and get somewhere. And so we did that, and then that's what I aired. And, you know, I was happy to have done that. But, you know, there, if you go back in my catalog, there are some other, other examples of impossible conversations that I, that I aired. And I, you know, I'm, I'm agnostic as to what the, the ultimate effect on the world is, but it, just in terms of how I kind of triage the use of my time at this point, I, I, I tend not to want to spend it that way. And I, and I cut my losses earlier now and this goes to your your initial question it's just like is this going anywhere okay uh, it's not let's just let's change the Mm -hmm. topic Mm -hmm. well i certainly did not mean to talk about rebecca traister she's not this was not uh my intention but you know what i remember of that interview between the two of you i i you felt i felt like you were sitting on your hands almost um which which you don't normally do. And I, it's not, I haven't listened to it more than once and it was been a really long time, but are, yeah. well, were, are well, you actually, sometimes, it, yeah, go yeah. ahead. I mean, that's, that's uh, perceptive of you. I mean, I, th- I think other people had that sense and, and were frustrated with me that I didn't push harder on certain points. But the, the, the reason why I didn't was I, I saw how haywire things were going to go if I did. And I, I saw the result of that. Like I just, it was just not, it was not. Um, uh, it wasn't going to be fun, and it wasn't going to be instructive. It was just going to be, uh, you know, bad, uh, bad radio in the end. Okay, but uh, here's but here's the thing: you and I think that's bad radio, uh, hmm. but there are lots of podcasters who would say, "Oh, that's that's gold." I mean, this is something right. I face a lot, and you know, just to, to be clear, I think Re- Rebecca, we have our differences, but she's. A, extremely bright person, really talented writer yeah. and reporter. So yeah. just to be sure, but uh, you know, this, when you have a podcast and you invite somebody onto it, how is, is there an obligation to, if you've invited them on, especially to not really take the gloves off to us to some extent, like, and, all, and actually, and you know, so there's that, but then in terms of just being successful as a podcaster. I mean, I've had people say to me, well, you had this interview go haywire. I would definitely, you're crazy not to air that. And my feeling is I don't want to run an interview with a mentally unwell person. I think that that is ethically irresponsible. But from a business standpoint, it might be economically irresponsible not to do it. Yeah. Well, I I guess I, I I, I, my philosophy around this is that I I never intend to do a gotcha interview. I never want to get someone at their worst, right? I'm never, you know, and I, I always tell people that if there's something we say here that uh, that you know you you don't want to air, well, you know, let, let's flag that, and we can we can just hide the seams as we go. I mean, I I don't send people the audio and give them an edit of it because that would be a nightmare, and you know, it would it would produce um, you know, just, you know, incoherent podcast, but in, in real time, in our conversation, if somebody says, okay, well, that, that's not what I meant to say. Uh, I, and, you know, and they, they, they want to take their foot out of their mouth or they want to, they want to take my foot out of there. Um, that's fine. I mean, I want people at their best. I want people, I want people to be, even no matter how much I, I may not like the person's point of view or may not even like the person, right. In certain cases, again, I've had someone, come on the podcast who uh, I think is, is a, a genuine bad actor, right. Who's, who's treated me badly or, or uh, others badly. And we're trying to sort something out, uh, 
you know, in conversation. I mean, someone like you know Ezra Klein was an example of this. Um, I still want them to be happy with their side of the conversation, right? So I, I could give people every opportunity to put their best foot forward. Um, so that's you know that's not where most journalists are, uh, and and I don't consider myself a journalist. Uh, and so it's that that's a difference that I I'm happy with. Uh, but as far as airing just every, um, every murder or every murder suicide on, on the program, it just, it's, um, it, I mean, it just, it depends what one's goal is. I just think it's, you know, yeah, yeah. Sometimes it's, you know, tension can be, can be good radio, but, um, I just, uh, I don't know. I, I, I feel like I, I, there's certain messages I don't want to send. And, you know, so insofar as I'm going to exert some kind of editorial control over, over what happens here. Um, one message I, I don't like to send is that it's hopeless, right? And sometimes it is hopeless. I mean, it's, ho- it's hopeless in the case of a specific encounter. Um, but what's the point of, of um, making that uh, epiphany you know, in some ways indelible, right? Like you just can't talk about this topic, right? This is just, you know, this is, this is just playing with plutonium. Um, I just don't, uh, you know, I just want to, I'll give it, I'll give it another try with somebody else, you know, and, and then, and show a path forward. Right. I just don't, I, I don't see the point of broadcasting too many failures of conversation. No. Um, although certainly people are, making a lot of money doing doing that with places like youtube what did you think about the the discussion with ezra klein um you know i i remember listening to it and you know i guess my confirmation bias would be more toward your side i remember listening to it and thinking you know you were clearly the quote-unquote winner but then i spoke to someone else who you know generally shares my my views um who thought uh, it was the other way around. <laughs> uh, and, and insofar as, you know, we don't want to really talk about who it's not a debate, it's a discussion, but, um, what, what did that feel like to you uh, after you did the conversation and then after it posted? Well, it, it was one of those conversations where it was, it was obvious that each of us would win for our respective audiences. Right. But, um, I respect my audience much more than I respect his. I mean, he, all he had to do to win for his audience was to make allegations of racism or, um, I, you know, uh, uh, tri- tribalism, right? I mean, for, uh, I mean all, all he has to do to win is to say, well, your wanting to get beyond race is just your way of being uh, identified as, you know, white and privileged, right? I mean, like that's, that's you know, that you have the luxury of getting beyond race. Um, so you're just, you're, you're playing as the, the same identity politics game as anyone else. Now that is absolutely untrue. I can, I can make it you know clear by argument that that's untrue, but for his audience, that, that view that everyone is inevitably stuck identifying with some, you know, subgroup, that's, that's just gospel. Right. I mean, that is, you know, that is the that doesn't have to be argued for. That's accepted as a dogma. Right. And it is patently it is patently obvious uh, that it's true for that audience and, and many things like that. I mean, just just the the allegation or the implication that, you know, as a white guy, you you know can't possibly understand uh, up or down on the topic of of race in this country, um, you know, or you know and and it, like that that just playing playing the the identity card on this topic for a certain audience that will always win right i mean it, it, you know like a very clear case of this is when i collided with ben affleck on on bill Maher show you know for he, for all he had to do to win this you know non debate with for his audience is to call us racist I mean, that's, that is just, that is a knockout blow. It's like, it's like for fully half the audience perceive that as him brilliantly unmasking our racism, 
right? Like like he's some it investigative was journalist, yes. right? Who discovered our racist past, <laughs> right? And then and unveiled the uh, unveiled the evidence in real time, right? No, all he did was allege that a certain position was racist, uh, and it, and for anyone who actually understood the issues, it was absolutely clear that he was wrong about that, right? But um, it's just for you just use these magic words and 50 percent of, of virtually any audience will be taken in by them. So when you know you're having a conversation w- with someone who's coming from their, you know, very uh, well populated echo chamber, um, you just you it's a fait accompli. You know that there's absolutely nothing you're going to say. Uh, it, it, no, no, no matter how persuasive it should be, and no matter how exhaustive and exhausting it, it is, I mean, you can just go, you can you can go on for you know, literally four hours. You'll you're you're never going to uh, defuse the the, um, the the power of these specific rhetorical moves, like calling someone racist. You know, like I mean, it's it's it, this is it's a debate about religion at this point. Right. There's yeah, well, a, reli- yeah. a religion of wokeness and you know, to, to use this topic that that cover the covers the Ezra Klein and, and Rebecca Tracer conversations. Um, you're, you're talking to people who are who are r- religious adherents and it's um, they're just, you know, they're taken in by the power of, of specific magic words. Well, it's like arguing with a conspiracy theorist. Right. You, yeah. you can't win because you're part of the conspiracy as far as they're concerned. So you started your podcast in 2013. What made you want to do it? Were there things going on in the world that you wanted to specifically address? Let's see. <clears throat> see if I can remember. Uh, well, I think I had been on a few other people's podcasts. I think I had been on Rogan's, I'm sure, at that point. And I just thought uh, this, you know, it would be fun to to play in this medium, you know, just to to speak and and kind of let the the first draft of one's thinking out there and and get feedback on it. And but very quickly, the um, the opportunity just it, it became obviously better than writing in two crucial ways. I mean, this is just this is just the power of incentives. I mean, one is that. I, I well, actually three crucial re- ways. You, you, if you write a book, you know you take a year to write a book. Uh, you know it's a, you know, sometimes two uh, or more, and then you have to wait for the better part of a year, usually something like eleven months, for it to be published, and then you um, it goes out there, and you know if you know the, the numbers of people who read it are a mere fraction of what you get with a successful podcast, right? So if, if the goal is to reach people in a timely way, there's just no comparison. And, and this is even with a successful book. I mean, you know, I've had several quote New York times bestsellers. Um, that is just, you know, the, the numbers of people I've reached with those books are a rounding out, a ra- rounding error on the numbers of people I've reached since I've started podcasting. Right, yeah, so I think just, people would be shocked when they hear what sales figures really are. What it what yeah. it takes to be a bestseller is not nearly what what people imagine. No, I mean there are bestsellers and, and there are bestsellers, and and I've had, um, I think five New York Times bestsellers, but it, the, the numbers of books sold is is minuscule, and the numbers of books sold that get read is you know right well smaller as, still as long as they buy it. But yeah. but so 2013. You know that was before the the discourse changed so radically. I mean, I feel like back in 2013 we were still able to talk about things in a relatively grown up manner. I didn't start. You know, I think we talked about this probably when I was talking on your show. Like, I I didn't start noticing the change until 2014, 2015. What? So were there? Do you remember like what your first? subject was on the show, what you, who your first guests were, like, were there things particularly bothering you or interesting, you know, that you found interesting at that time that you wanted to delve into? Well, I, well, I can actually look, do you want me, do you want me to actually have this inaccurate? No, it does. I'm uh, just, you know, if there's anything, um, um, cause you know, this was not, uh, you, you were, you were in this before, uh, 
everybody else was for the most part. Um, and you weren't reacting to Trump. I mean, I think a lot of these yeah, podcasts have Trump, come yeah. up. Yeah, they've come up not only reacting to Trump, but people but reacting to people reacting to the Trump era. So, um, you know, and I'm, I'm also curious, like, if you were you talking to journalists right away and, and, and if you even like talking to, to journalists and, and writers as much as mm. scientists or uh, other kinds yeah. of people. Yeah, well, so so um, uh, the first consideration was just uh, how many people I could reach and how quickly. Like, you know, I have an idea and I want to express it and I can express it now and uh, people can be hearing it tomorrow, right, and reacting to it tomorrow. And uh, uh, and the scale of it, you know, is... is uh, completely astonishing when you're coming from the the world of books. So, uh, that, that was immediately attractive, but then I realized, and, and I think the first things I, I released were just pieces of audio that was just, you know, like audio essays or just me talking. Um, but then I decided, well, uh, now I want to talk to some people. Uh, and I realized that it could just be a kind of I mean, almost a guilty pleasure because I could decide what book I want to read next and I want to read this book anyway, but then I I could kill two birds with one stone and talk to the author of the book, and so I started doing that, and then I realized it's it's just a, a, a nice thing to be able to offer someone else. I mean, it's not you know once I had an audience, it wasn't a matter of people doing me a favor by coming on the podcast. They really wanted to be on the podcast to talk about their issue or promote their book, so um. It just there was just a real um, uh, good feeling of of synergy with it, which is again is it's unusual when you come from the place of of just spending years working in solitude on books, right? You just you know, you're not you, even if you wind up. I, mean, I didn't tend to interview people for my books, but even that is a a different and and more selfish enterprise. Like I'm, I'm going to now take a few hours of your time and who knows if any of this is going to show up in my book and is who knows what benefit that could possibly be for you. Um, whereas here I have a venue I can invite you to and at very little cost. I mean, it's really just a phone call. You know, you can be talking to uh, hundreds of thousands or even millions of people. Um, it's just a great, it's just a great thing to be able to, to offer to the other people who sh in most cases should be more famous and influential than they are. Right. I mean, they, you know, I, I think we want public intellectuals to be, to have more of a presence in culture uh, than they do uh, certainly in America. And um, yeah, so the, the, you know, the, the golden age of, of audio that podcasting has ushered in has been very helpful there, I mean, we, we, you know, if the, there have been many changes for the worse of late, but one change for the better is that there's so there's so many high quality conversations you can listen to now. But were you back in 2013 becoming wary with the mainstream media, or had that frustration not kicked in quite yet? Like, were you no. sitting there listening to NPR and thinking, like, what what happened here? There's nothing going on here, or was that later? No, I, yeah, I had not been um, really well it, on a few topics. I noticed that the the mainstream media was was reliably biased, right, and that that troubled me. But like, what topics? Well, you know the the uh, the connection between the actual doctrine of Islam and the phenomenon of jihadist terrorism that was being endlessly obfuscated by. You know, our, our best sources of news. You know, the, the New York Times could could be counted on to to write a a really slipshod and biased article, more or less always in response to terrorism. Right? They just you know, I mean, there there are articles on on jihadist terrorism where you can't even figure out what the you know what the um, the ideal the ideological uh, commitments of the perpetrators are right islam is never mentioned uh i mean they just do every i mean you you'd think that maybe the the franciscans blew blew up this <laughs> plane this time around i mean it's just mm -hmm. it's bonkers um so 
and, and, and it's, and it's clear how, how, um, they were bending over backwards to do that out of, uh, some kind of, uh, under some kind of policy of political correctness that, that related to, to, um, you know, Islam being you know, a, a, something that, that only, that only a bigot would, would criticize. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're there with the, the, the burners of the Quran, if you're going to link the, you know, these specific doctrines to the, the actual religion. Um, so I was noticing that, but I wasn't noticing it happen, happening on every other topic. And, um, yeah, so it hadn't, you know, the wheels hadn't come off yet, but I, I was I was noticing how for me personally, um, <clears throat> putting, putting any of my content in a, um, even the best mainstream outlets was there, there was no longer an incentive to do it. Right. It's like I, at that point I was blogging a fair amount and the, the numbers of people who would read my next blog article would be better than, than the, the, you know, the, the those who would read any article I would, I would place anywhere else with, with the possible exception of an op-ed in the New York times. Right. So for, for me to, for, for me to write an op-ed for the, the LA Times or the Boston Globe, or or to try to get an article into you know Vanity Fair or something, or the Atlantic. Uh, at that point, it seemed synonymous with my just hiding my content for no good reason. I mean, why would I? Why would I want to do that? So and and were you feeling too like you were not going to be able to say quite the same things if you wrote something? Or yeah. the New York Times or elsewhere. Yeah, well, certainly on the. I mean, I had, I did have this experience with, um, uh, specifically on the point of of Islam and and terrorism. Yes, I mean, I, I found uh, op eds rejected by, I don't know, it might have been the Washington Post or I mean, it was clearly there were there were, um, uh, you know, something had been su- 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 solicited. I submitted it. It went through, you know, editorial review, and then the the kinds of things they were not comfortable saying were were just a deal breaker for me. Mm-hmm. Right, so I've, I've had some failed op eds, but um, it wasn't so much that. It was just uh, when you look at how many people, you know, read articles, it's you just you just you, you get the numbers, and then you decide is there any advantage to having fewer people read this thing I took the time to write. Um, and it's, uh, I mean, usually the answer is no, unless you're trying to, to, to maximize your contact with a specific audience. So this thing that we call the culture wars, again, there's all these terms floating around that have, that are increasingly meaningless. When did you start to be aware of them or care about them? The stuff that we have been talking about ad nauseum for the last several years, just, um, you know, identitarianism infiltrating all kinds of cultural and academic institutions, this, all, all this kind of stuff. When did it start to bother you? Well, it, again, it bothered me on, on specific topics at the very beginning. I mean, with my, you know, my first book was a, a broadside against organized religion, you know, the, the end of faith. And, um, and it was also, it was a, it was an attack, not just on fundamentalism, but also on religious moderation. In, in some ways, I, I put even more opprobrium on on religious moderates because, really, they you know they don't have the the courage of of their convictions the way fundamentalists do, and they don't actually have a leg to stand on theologically. No, their their minds have just been changed by science and modernity generally, and they haven't admitted the the origin of those changes and. They just ignore what's in the holy books, right? So I, there was even more, um, more criticism directed at moderates and fundamentalists. But um, after releasing that book, or even in the process of trying to get it published, I discovered you know, the, the 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 size and and shape of the the Overton window on on this on these sets of topics, right, re- related to. I mean, specifically uh, religion and its, its conflict with science and um, uh, just, our, you know, our response to 9-11 with respect to Islam, right? So there were a few different cuts at that that topic, but it was, um, yeah, I was just noticing that 
certain things were considered taboo to speak about, you know, and even among atheists, among atheists, it was taboo to treat religions differently. You know, and most atheists thought all religions were equally bad, equally confused, equally at odds with science, equally inimical to a modern secular uh, uh, approach to, to ethics. Um, and they were very uncomfortable hearing that, no, actually some religions are, are more rational than others. Some religions are more benign than others. Some religions are, 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 you know, are not even worth worrying about. And some represent a, a kind of political emergency at this moment. Um, so I was, from the moment I started, you know, producing anything publicly, you know, by, you know, by way of writing or speaking, I was coming up against this, um, you know, what I was calling at the time political correctness uh, and the um, the power of, of um, uh, taboo and, and false consensus to, to um, prevent honest conversation on important topics. And do you... I mean, I think we're we're about the same age. You're, I think you're a few years older than I am. When do you, when you think of political correctness as you were imagining it or experiencing it back in you know the the mid aughts? Oh no, not the mid aughts. The mid whatever, two thousand ten, two thousand eleven, thirteen. Yeah, you know, like, my first book came out in two thousand four. So okay, so yeah. early aughts. So was that manifesting differently than? You remember it, say back in the in the late eighties, early nineties, when the I think that's when the coinage political correctness kind of first took hold. What differences were you seeing by the early aughts? You know, I, I think I was just oblivious to it before I started writing uh, professionally. I, I you know I, I was you know in my twenties, I spent a lot of time thinking about more esoteric topics. I mean, I was I was spending a lot of time. Uh, meditating, on, you know, on formal retreats. I, I spent a lot of time in India and Nepal studying meditation. And when I wasn't doing that, I was thinking and beginning to to write about the the nature of the mind, and you know, to kind of doing work in philosophy of mind. And then I had to go back to school and and finish my my degree and, and get my PhD. And and all of that was, you know, so the the topics that that occupied me were um, not at all political. Right, I just I was just not focused on on it. So I, I it's hard for me when I look back based on you know what I read about the time now. You know what we're dealing with now seems to have been there in 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 crystal form. But it, you know I, I I share the sense that something really went haywire somewhere around 2014 or so. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess 2014, 2015 is when this group emerged that was uh, eventually called the intellectual dark web. (laughs) And uh, that would, so the kind of main figures uh, there would be people like Brett Weinstein and Eric Weinstein. Um, I believe you were part of this group. I think you have uh, tried to distance yourself from at least the term. So I want to ask you about that. But, you know, this was this kind of loose constellation of thinkers. Um, uh, I don't want to leave with Steven Pinker, maybe part of this. They they were, uh, I, I actually wrote about the IDW in the Los Angeles Times and I think it was like March of 2000, I don't know, 16 or something like that. Um, but it really, people got to know about it from Barry Weiss's piece in the New York Times. And I can't remember who all was featured in that piece. Christina Hoff Summers was one. So I mean, what, what did you think of that? Like it was a, there was a sort of suddenly this kind of these, these informal conversations that were happening on, on YouTube and in podcasts and kind of coming up organically were now uh, being packaged as, as a thing. Uh, so I wonder what your initial response was to that and, and how it may have evolved over time. Yeah, well, it always seemed like a, a, I mean, it, it was tongue in cheek initially. I mean, exactly, so we, we exactly. We launched a, yes. the meme from my podcast and I was at, I, I, I launched it, um, by titling a podcast, uh, you know, something, you know, intellectual dark web was in, was in the podcast. And this was a phrase that had been first spoken by Eric Weinstein and, um, 
like um, totally off the cuff, by the way. Yeah. So he was, I think he was on the, with Dave Rubin or something. And he was just, he kind of. No, just, I think the first, well, the first use, it, it was in, I mean, maybe he'd used it in other contexts, but the, the podcast where I launched it was a podcast, I believe he and I and. Oh, it was ben, yours. Okay. And Shapiro had Dan been on stage okay. in San Francisco. And so I, I released the audio of that live event. And uh, it titled it, you know, something having to do with the intellectual dark web. Okay, so it, this is your fault, really. Is yeah, your... <laughs> yeah, it is, it is my fault. Um, but it's 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 really Eric's fault. But I I um I I always made it clear that it was always tongue in cheek from my point of view. And then there were, there were different attitudes with respect to this this grouping w- within the group. I mean, I, Eric was not always joking. I, mean, I think Eric felt it was more of a thing than I did. Uh, and, and, um, so I mean, it, it was somewhat, in my view, it was somewhat analogous to the, the new atheist thing. It was a, and it was, some, it was an epiphenomenon of, in, in the case of new atheism, it was just a publishing phenomenon. It was just a fact that the, the four of us, uh, who, you know, four of us atheists had published books on athe essentially on atheism, although in the end of faith, I never even used the word um, that had become bestsellers, right? And this is me and Christopher Hitchens and Dan Dennett and Richard Dawkins, and so um, it was just it, we got wrapped up as a you know in a in a single uh, term as essentially a four headed atheist, and then then treated as essentially a single person in all of the the pushback we got. You know, against our, our arguments um, that uh, you know drew invidious comparisons between science and religion, and uh, so it, what was really inconvenient about that is that people treated us as though we had the precisely the same views on every topic, and which which of course we didn't. Um, so it was just misleading. You know, people would say, "Well, they you know these guys don't understand." you know, religion and spirituality at all, right? They had no, they have no experience of, 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 uh, you know, the, the, the deeper truths to which our religions give witness. Well, I mean, that's, that's probably not true of any of us, but it certainly wasn't true of me. I mean, it was like, like I had spent, you know, literally years on silent meditation retreats and, uh, you know, endlessly studied religion, um, East and West. And, you know, so it's just, it's just not, it was it's just not helpful to be uh summarized as being part of a group um in that sense and it was even less helpful in the case of the idw because people just started getting added to this being <laughs> yeah. it's um, unclear what the uh what the requirements were for yeah entry. and you know so i was finding myself in the company of you know candace owens and um and then and i was vulnerable to the next uh thing that you know, Dave Rubin or Brett Weinstein would say, uh, and it, it just, I found, I, I found myself getting so much hate mail that wasn't actually addressed to me that I, I just thought that, you know, this was, this was always a joke in my mind. Uh, and now I'm, and now there's, you know, there's so much daylight between me and some of the people who are also considered to be part of the IDW I just have to make it clear that you know I don't consider myself part of this group, and and so that, so then I did that at some point on my podcast. Is it possible to have any kind of um, to, to have space for people doing the kinds of things that people like you are doing, people like you are doing, without it emerging as a group just in people's minds? I mean, how how do we expect people in the world to even sort of process? what this is, especially at this, at this point. I mean, I, I, I'm sure you get this too. I get people saying like, oh, well now what, you've, you've just given up. You're just, you're just one of these fringe, you, you just want to say whatever you want to say. And you're just one of these fringe people. And you're just, you're just asking questions, this kind of thing. And I just, I'm always struggling with how to fine tune this kind of mode of, of conversation. Uh, I don't, I don't know what I'm asking exactly, but I, I just, I wonder, I mean, this is something that you've been extremely successful with. You've just stayed the course and, and I think you're, you're just very disciplined with the way you comport yourself and, and present your ideas and kind of, you know, speak with your guests. But is it, is it just, um, is it, is it just unavoidable that this is going to look like 
some kind of tribal movement, a tribe that complains about tribalism? Well, no. I mean, o- again, only if people are committed to seeing the world that way. And you know, some people are. I mean, this this comes back to that Ezra Klein point. I mean, he thinks I'm practicing my own version of identity politics. But what's my identity, right? I mean, the, the, the lazy uh, allegation here would be, well, I'm a, 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 uh, a wealthy white man, right, who's, you know, overeducated. Um, you know, I'm an elitist, you know, a white elitist, uh, you know, cisgendered, hetero. I mean, like you keep, keep adding um, variables there. But if, if you just look at my my disagreement with Klein, right? It, you know, he and I should be part of the same tribe. Then, right? I mean, we 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 are, we align on virtually all of those variables. But he's precisely the person I can't talk to, right? So, how how does that make any sense as an allegation in the context of our disagreement? I've got way more in common with Ayan Hirsi Ali than I have with Ezra Klein. You know, she's black, she's African, she's um, a woman. Uh, it's just, she's my sister, right? She's, and he is, is someone who is acting in utter bad faith from my point of view, right? So um, the allegation of tribalism just makes no sense to me. Um, and it's, it's also... You know, I, I, so I don't consider myself part of any group and I'm not ideological, right? So I, like, I, I'm not, you know, I, I tend to be left on, on many questions I mean, certainly virtually all social questions. Um, and therefore, you know, his, historically I've, I've really only voted Democrat, right? And I am a registered Democrat, but, you know, I spend most of my time criticizing the left at this point because it's derangement is so intolerable, um, and affecting everything. But, um, you know, I've, I've said as much, uh, as many bad things about Trump as anyone, right? It's so it's, you know, I've, I've, I've criticized both sides of the political spectrum. Um, but I'm not going to be dishonest in my criticism of someone like Trump. So when the left is calling him racist for something that actually gives no evidence of racism, you know, I, I'm not going to, to echo that calumny, even if I actually think he's racist, which I, which I do, right? It's like, I, I just, but if you think you, you just have to extend a principle of charity and, you know, intellectual and, and maintain intellectual rigor, even when you're dealing with your enemies, I mean, even when you're dealing with people who you think are truly irredeemable, it's like, I mean, even, even when you're dealing with Hitler, right? Like, like you can, you can criticize Hitler and point out what was wrong about his worldview and what was wrong about him without exaggerating how bad an artist he was, right? It's like, maybe he's, a, he's, a, he's actually, a, he's a better artist than many people give him credit for, right? It's like, it's so it's not, it, it, you just, it's so lazy to uh, just to, to, to make no, to make no effort to get the details right is, uh, it's like, it, it just, it just opens you to endless embarrassment. I mean, it's, it's like, you know, you read, yeah, I mean, this is a trick that I forget which author played this in, in his book, but he presented a page of text, uh, and then, you know, the, the, it, it, it rolled over to the next page. And it's only, only when you, only when you turn the page, do you see who wrote this piece of text, so you're, this comes sort of in the flow of, of uh, some argument, and basically it reads as, as a completely reasonable diagnosis of some of the problems of modernity, and then you flip the page and you see that it's an excerpt from the <laughs> Unabomber's Manifesto, right? <laughs> yeah, the Unabomber's Manifesto had uh, you know, uh, some very reasonable things yeah, in it. Yeah, it right? had some attributes, yeah. Well, I mean, it was long enough, so it's yes, hard. there's yeah, got to be something just in by there. dint of luck, yeah. <laughs> right. Well, I mean, to this idea of criticizing the left and also being on the left, you know, what do you do with the people who say, why are you spending all this time beating up on 
on the left when there are uh, tiki torch tiki torch carrying Nazis marching in Charlottesville and Trumpism is on the on the rise and et cetera et cetera. We've heard all of this. I I find it it's it's not it's a boring question at this point, but it's also to be fair an obvious it's an obvious question for a reason. People I think some people genuinely don't understand why if we're in such a time of political and cultural crisis, people like us are wasting our time with this. And my answer is, well, uh, I find this more interesting. And that's actually not a very satisfying answer. It's a little selfish. So I I wonder if you have uh, a better response to that. Yeah, no, I think I can shore up your your response a little bit. I mean, the interesting point is valid. I mean, you know, what is wrong with the tiki torch carrying white supremacists and anti-Semites is so obvious and is so, it, it doesn't require an argument. It doesn't require, I mean, literally it's, 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 everything's right on the surface, right? You just have to point it out. Okay. What's wrong with them is they are in many cases, actual Nazis, right? I mean, what about, uh, you know, Nazi or neo-Nazi don't you understand at this point in history? Um, so there's very little to say now it's not you know I've done podcasts on white supremacy and just just trying to figure out how big a thing it is currently in the U.S. and if it became bigger, well then I think we would need to spend more time talking about it and, and talking about you know what to do about it. But it really is a I'm convinced it is still a a a real fringe phenomenon and you know apart from the fact that it seemed to be given a little more energy and, 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 you know, freedom to move under Trump. Uh, it, it still is the fringe of the fringe in yeah. my view. Right? Do we and, have numbers? I'm sorry to interrupt you, but do you know if there are actual hard numbers on how many quote unquote white supremacists there are, you know, the, the marchers in Charlottesville, how many were there? A couple thousand and the counter protesters oh, outnumbered them by orders of magnitude. Do we, do we know how many of those people there are? Yeah, no, I I don't think we do. And, and part of the reason is that the people whose job it has been to, to keep watch on all of this and, and, and tell us how worried we should be, have revealed themselves in recent years to be totally unreliable. I mean, the the, the Southern Poverty Law Center. Yeah. Southern Poverty Law Center. I mean, there are very few, um, wholesale changes in reputation uh i mean this this astonishing i mean they, it went from this utterly noble and necessary organization to a a a uh, all too well funded uh group of of crackpots and hysterics uh who were you know finding racists under every rock and i mean you know I, you know i i say this as a a personal target of their lunacy. Yeah, I mean, they, weren't you, know, you on their uh, their yeah, hate watch list yeah, for a while I wound, there? I wound up on their hate watch page. Um and you know as did Majid Nawaz. I mean Majid, you know, sued them, you know, being in England and and where it's much easier to sue people for libel. You know, Majid sued them and got I think, you know, three and a half million dollars for his troubles because their allegations have just been so insane. But you know they they, they made they've made allegations against Ayan Hirsi Ali and you know Charles Murray and like just lots of people who are who are absolutely not white supremacists and you know they're they're wrapped up in the same breath as David Duke or you know anyone else who who is a white supremacist. So it's crazy over there, but uh, so it, it's hard to find out. It's hard it's hard to know what the actual numbers are, uh, and. Um, but and we should we should notice the the work of bad incentives here. I mean, when you have an organization like the Southern Poverty Law Center that has to raise millions of dollars each year to function, right? It's got a massive budget. Um, it's not in the business of putting itself out of business, right? It has to keep finding the a reason for its existence year after year. So if we if we ever solve the problem of white supremacy uh, in this country. Um, given the incentives, the, um, the Southern Poverty Law Center might be the last to admit it, 
Right. Right. So, well, this is what's happening with GLAD and the ACLU right. when it comes yeah. to, you know, LGBT. Yeah. So that we, we do have an incentive yeah. problem. I mean, it's an incentive problem with, with many charities, uh, but it's, it's specific. It, it's, it's especially bad when you're talking about these kinds of, you know, culture war issues. Um, so yeah, I don't think we know, but I, it, it's just, what is clear is that white supremacy and, um, you know, real, real racism, ideological racism is not influencing the culture and, and mainstream institutions to any significant degree, right? It's like, there's no, there are, you know, there are no fortune 500 companies and, uh, you know, Hollywood movie studio, movie studios and universities that will, you know, tell you that the, the Holocaust didn't happen and, uh, you know, black people are, are subhuman. Right. And, and, like, that's, it's just, and it's been that way for a long time. Now. Yeah. I mean, this, the, 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 these, these views are, are absolutely reviled by mainstream culture and to be a part of the white supremacist fringe is to be disqualified for inclusion in almost any, uh, you know, good organization or sane conversation about public policy. I mean, it's just, it's just not happening. We're, we're not having to deal with Nazis in our, in our daily lives. Uh, and again, I'm not, I'm not denying that there are some number of these people in our society and that they, they may yet create a tremendous amount of harm, right? I mean, the next Oklahoma City bombing level event could be a, a very big deal and tip us into something very ugly politically in this country. I mean, certainly given given the, the four years we experienced under Trump and the aftermath, given cultic movements like QAnon, uh, it, you know, it's... Um, this is there, there's a powder keg phenomenon on on the the, the fringes there that that uh, could affect the, the lives of everyone else, and it's it, we're right to be concerned about it, and I'm, I'm I'm definitely keeping my eye on it, but it is just not a mainstream phenomenon. Whereas, um, and it wasn't even it wasn't a mainstream phenomenon even with Trump in the White House, right? I mean, it's, it's no having Trump in the White House was not having was not the same thing as having a white supremacist in the White House. And again, I, and I say this as someone who th who believes he knows to a a moral certainty that Trump actually is a you know uh, certainly an Archie Bunker like racist. Yeah, do you actually think he's a, he's a racist? I mean, I've talked about this <clears> with people. I don't actually think he's a sexist. I think he's a womanizer. Right. I don't think he's yeah. a misogynist. I just think these are these are you know, these are tiny little discrepancies, but like, is he, a, he's an opportunist. So he'll, he'll take anybody he can get. Right. Right. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I think he's a, a, um, I mean, I think he's an absolutely odious person. Right. And I, I think, and from what I believe, what I have seen of him publicly and what I've heard about him privately, I think he is, um, you know, it's absolutely shocking that he managed to become president. And it's, um, it's a, it suggests a, a terrifying vulnerability we have for, you know, con men and, uh, uh, lunatics, uh, more, you know, certainly moral lunatics get, getting, uh, uh, power in this country. Um, so it's, you know, I, I viewed his presidency as a disaster, but he was not, a grand dragon of the KKK, and he was not giving witness to a massive cultural influence of you know white supremacist thinking in our society. And to the degree that the left alleged that, the the left went you know, properly crazy under Trump. Um, and um, so the asymmetry here is important to point out. The reason why we focus on, on what's happening on the left, the, the extreme voices of, of wokeness and, and social justice and uh, um, identity politics there is because the, the fringe on the left isn't just the fringe anymore. The fringe on the left has fully captured our institutions. It's captured academia 
It's captured the media. It's captured tech. It's captured Hollywood. Uh, and so, I mean, we're, we're living in a world where the most powerful people in our society you know, produce their own hostage videos, right. sa- saying, right. just rending themselves, talking about their their ra- internalized racism and how they're going to yeah. do better. And and it's they're not, you know, I mean, and the, the most powerful people have a kind of Stockholm syndrome yeah, here where well, they're just, they don't even know what's happening well, to them. Well, that's the thing is they don't, we say capture and we actually literally mean that because yeah. I, uh, the, these people who are in charge of these institutions don't actually believe this stuff. See, this is what I, I keep coming up against. It's almost like we're fighting some kind of phantom. I mean, we're reacting to the fringes on the left and the right. And insofar as this very vocal minority on the left has managed to attain this outsized influence. I'm curious, do you have any thoughts like what goes on in the human mind that has allowed this to happen? I can't believe that, you know, many, if any, CEOs of of major companies uh, think this is anything but nonsense. So what is so difficult about standing up to it? It's useful to, to focus on specific strands of this problem because it's, um, it's clarifying. So you take something like uh, police violence, right? Police violence against uh, young black men, for the mm-hmm. most part, right? Like th- this became the, the kind of the master variable of the last year. You know, in, in the the aftermath of of um, the killing of George Floyd, uh, everyone I mean, there was a virtual consensus in our society, certainly on the left. Uh, and it, it subsumed you know, most of the center uh, that what we had witnessed there was just proof positive of a an epidemic of sadistic, racist behavior on the part of cops directed at black men in our society. It's been going on for years. It's a legacy, ultimately, of, of slavery. Uh, but it's who could doubt that we have an epidemic of of white cops killing black men completely out of proportion to their representation in society uh, and in ways that are completely unwarranted, right? Um, now, people thought they have, people, people genuinely believe they have seen the evidence based on cell phone video. Right. This is like, how could you watch it with nine minutes watching this black man who's already cuffed and immobilized and therefore no threat to anyone, watching him asphyxiated by the knee of a of a um, sadistic white Derek Chauvin. Right. Every the whole country, the whole world saw that. Now, um, I would argue that this is a mass delusion. Right. I mean, what you you know, I saw the same video and I was just as appalled by it as as any other morally sane person was. But the video itself offered absolutely no evidence of racism. Zero. Right. Um, And I can show you an analogous video where the same thing happens to a white guy. Right. So. um, so what what we're dealing with here is is the effects of a of of media and social media and a kind of it's it's a kind of uh political pornography that has has um has effect, has affected everything right i mean and in, in this case we have you know I see half it as a, a dozen, cartoon it's almost like a cartoon it's exaggerated like well, it's just, you see it's, it's, pornography. Very, it's very hard to yeah. interpret. I mean, unless right. you unless you know, I mean, there's a, there's a lot to talk about with respect to these videos, and I, I've spent a lot of time doing this on my in various podcasts. But what, for the most part, most people when they see a video of an arrest gone wrong, you know, an arrest that escalates into violence, most people have terrible intuitions uh, for what they're looking at. Right? They just don't. They they do not understand. The continuum of force that cops have to be uh, thinking about and responding to in each moment. They, they don't. They don't understand a cop's eye view of the world. They don't understand the absolute primacy of 
of what the, the person being arrested is doing with their hands or not doing with their hands, right? What, what, you know, whether or not they seem to be complying with, with the cop's instructions. Not, none of this relates to the Chauvin video because that was, you know, he was already cuffed and, and that was a very different situation. But so people watch these videos and they just, they have crazy intuitions about what should have happened, what could have happened, what was, what it was rational or ethical for a cop to do in that situation, how likely a person would have been treated the same way had their, the color of their skin been different. Um, and people have absolutely no awareness of the actual statistics around violence and police violence in our society. And they, they just, they're completely confused. They think, I mean, they just have no idea how many people get killed each year by cops and well, under what circumstances. Right. Because they're seeing every video, every single incident they're seeing. There's usually, if there is video of it, that video will go No, well, viral. but that's not true. They're, they're seeing video of black suspects being right, mistreated that's what I by mean. cops. That, they're that's almost, what I'm they're saying. almost yeah. never seeing video of white suspects being mistreated by cops. And there are more of them. Right. There are more yeah. there are more white well, people right. killed by cops every year than black people. Although, yes, but it proportionally there are still I think there are more unarmed well, black men killed by. Well, well no, but I know. It, yeah, no, go ahead. No, no, but it's, it's good. To, we might as well just dot our I's and cross our T's here because um, it, it matters it, You know, for virtually every year, you know, in recent memory, about a thousand Americans are killed by cops each year. Uh, the. The, the vast majority of those people killed by cops were violently resisting arrest, usually with firearms, right? These are not innocent people. It just it goes haywire and it, for, for the reasons that that only the cops know. And, you know, they get executed on the side of the road by a, a lunatic cop. No, these are people who, for the most part, are trying to kill the cops, right? Um, and uh, the numbers of people who are unarmed, uh, and who, you know, who may be violently, res- still violently resisting arrest, but who are unarmed, who get killed each year, are around 40, right? So you have a thousand people who get killed, about 40 of them are unarmed, about 10 or, you know, 20 of them uh, at most are black, right? And so there's, a, you know, there's a dozen people each year who are unarmed, who are black, who get killed by cops, right? Now you would think, and this is a, this is on the back of, of tens of millions of encounters with cops each year, right? So if, if we are going to, if, if our society is going to be absolutely riven by the next video of a black man being an unarmed black man being killed by a cop, it will be riven every single year until the end of time, because we are, we're never going to get down to zero, right? Certainly not unless we completely change the complexion of crime in our society. Um, Or somehow dismantle policing in some profoundly destructive way. And you you just, just look at Portland to imagine what the effects of that would be. Um, you have your, your homicide rate can go up by 800%. Um, the, but the, in terms of the representation in society, right, there are two, uh, intuitions you could, you could have about this. I think only one of them makes sense. You could say, well, uh, cops are, uh, you could, you could say, well, uh, African Americans are 13% of this, of the population, so anything more than 13% of arrests and 13% of, of negligent uh, homicides or, or justified homicides on the part of the cops, uh, anything more than that has to be a sign of racism, you know, or, you know, pr- inappropriate profiling of, of black suspects. Well, no, because, uh, African Americans are involved in a vastly disproportionate amount of violent crime. You know, I mean, they're, 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 you know, African American crime counts for fifty percent, and in some cases more, of violent crime in America. Right, but so, they're, the argument is that's a product of systemic racism. Well, okay, but it's it, it is one that's a bad argument. I mean, you could, even if you're going to to allege that that um, 
it, it, that's the well, origin it's a vague, story. It's a vague for argument. It. Yeah. Well, it's just that there's nothing. There's no what 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 systemically racist policy can we change today that will prevent the murders we know will happen in Chicago this weekend to black people by black people, right? Like like if if we could wave a magic wand and get rid of all the racists and all the racist policies, uh, would we expect fewer murders this weekend in Chicago, right? That's it's a very hard argument to make. I mean, so it's it's how we solve the murder problem in the black community is a is a uh, is a very difficult question to answer, uh, and it is by no means clear that the current existence of racists or racist policies is is the proximate cause. Right now, you might say it's the the the, the original cause, um, but um, even if we acknowledge that. It doesn't necessarily give us the remedy in the current in the current circumstance, uh, but it's just it's just a fact that when you when you the, if police are going to be looking to stop the most violent crimes as they should, they are going to be meeting far many more black people, a disproportionate number of black people, than Asians in attempting to do that, and they'll be doing it. And and if they're effective, they will be stopping the murders of disproportionately black people because you know, the, 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 the overwhelming number of victims of black crime. Um, this, you know, white people tend to kill white people, black people tend to kill black people, uh, et cetera. So, um, it's, uh, so, you know, you can, it seems, it seems totally irrational to expect that the third, that the, uh, of the thousand people who are killed every year, by cops in America, thirteen percent of them should be black. Not given the fact that fifty percent of violent crime is is being committed by African Americans, and so, and the circumstances under which cops are forced to draw their guns and defend themselves are in responding to you know the work of violent criminals for the most part. Um, so, and and the, so, the truth is the, the the numbers killed each year are somewhere between. Those two numbers. I mean, it's not that fifty percent of, you know, f- black people commit fifty percent of violent crime currently in America. They're not fifty percent of the people killed by cops. They're more like, uh, I believe it's it's closer to thirty percent. Um, so, it's um, anyway. I mean, you know, th- these are it's it's a hard this is a hard conversation to have, but it's an impossible conversation to have if you're going to uh, allege that. One wh- white guy like me can't say anything, right? And two, uh, the answer has to be always racism, uh, and th- and that's and that's where the left seems to be on, on this topic, right? And so, you know, getting back to the question that that led to this, why? What do you imagine these? These gatekeepers, these editors of newspapers, these you know he- heads of organizations, are they just like sitting around somewhere saying, "Well, we you know there's a you know there's there's a viral video of this uh, you know white police officer uh, shooting an unarmed black man. Uh, we're going to do something with this, and we are going to ignore the the gang violence that happened in Chicago over the weekend." Like, what? Where is this coming from? Because it, I, I think that it's just like. There's this sense that everyone is in a, a defensive crouch, and you know all it's going to take is is one person to kind of change the approach, and the rest will follow. But this this kind of collective hostage situation, uh, it it seems unending. Yeah, you know it it, it depends how informed someone is. I mean, you're talking if you're talking about the editor of a a newspaper, yeah, that's like a the pretty New York informed Times, person, right? That, that, that then there's there's a lot of bad faith. And uh, and intellectual dishonesty. But are they and, afraid? They're are they are they afraid, or do you think they really? I mean, I guess it depends on the person, this individual basis. But like, are they? Are, do they really think that there is some? Um, there's some. You know, it's you're on the right side of history, or there's a you're at a morally righteous position to to proceed this yeah. way, or are they just afraid of Twitter? Well, I, I think it's both, and I, I think you know one can grade into the 
to the other. I mean, you, you, your your motives for doing anything can be can be multiple, right? And self reinforcing, and the, you don't. Most people don't spend a lot of time uh, scrutinizing their actual motives. They just feel pushed or pulled uh, strongly, and they get and to resist that push or pull is is uncomfortable, and they they tend not to think more about it. But there's a there's a false consensus here that exerts a lot of pressure on people. I mean, to, I mean, the reason why I brought up the the police violence case is just in that in that case, I think most people genuinely thought they had had seen the evidence, right? Like this was a racist murder. This was a lynching. We all saw it, um, and so our our society that that we need a reckoning around this. This is this is. The, the cancer is visible, right? Um, but the truth is, as I said, there was zero evidence of racism in that video. Now, I'm not saying it may, it may come to light that Derek Chauvin is a is a you know, raging white supremacist, right? That may be it could have been his motive. I'm, I'm just saying we don't know that, and we still we still don't. The guy has been sentenced to prison, and we still don't know that, right? Um, but the Every, because everyone felt they had seen it, that you know, most people who felt it a moral imperative to react against racism on the basis of that, I think they were doing so in in good faith. I mean, they just they 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 their eyes weren't lying, right? Um, but the truth is, they're absolutely wrong about what they think is true down uh, on this particular topic i mean like, like you know los angeles erupted in in riots right how many people rioting in los angeles would know that 2019 had been the year of of literally the lowest use of force in the history of the LAPD right like that like the, the LAPD had never been better in in minimizing their use of force against anyone right and 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 the the decrease in in police violence had been had been you know gathering gathering energy for 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 decades right so it's like like it was just if you just look at the numbers there was nothing but progress and yet we, we as a society we're reacting like it's never been worse um it's uh and 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 so it, 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 the the problem with what's coming from the left and and the effect it's having on mainstream institutions again like the New York Times is that pe- we're we're the, the, again, Trump aside I mean yes Trump did represent a kind of uh, anomaly or or you know kind of backsliding I, I could see how it, it seemed like a kind of political backsliding in what was otherwise a story of, of moral progress. Um, but the, we have mainstream institutions which are uh, among the least racist collections of people and collections of ideas that have ever existed rending themselves over their supposed racism. I mean, an institution like Princeton University you know, they, it publishes an open letter signed by hundreds of professors castigating itself for its history of racism and you know it's just an absolute mea culpa which uh you know rather delightfully was was taken at face value by the the trump justice department and, and they said well if you've been you know racist all this while maybe we should you know open an investigation into you to see if you're in violation of the 1964 right. oh, civil great. rights act that was great right it yeah. almost made me love trump to, to exactly because, well, because, it was because, betsy devos but it was betsy devos wasn't it yeah it was yeah. Uh, one of two things that she did right but it was, I mean, it was so, it was so dishonest, you know, and, uh, I mean, the, the head of admissions at Princeton at that point, it may still be, was African-American and you know, Princeton's, Princeton practices aggressive affirmative action, right? And they they have many celebrated black intellectuals on their faculty. And it's just, this is not a racist place. Uh, and yet the, the fact that that there was a you know a consensus there and and in mainstream institutions like the New York Times that would report on this topic that they you know finally they finally they they're dealing with their 
the the, the absolute poison in their system. Um, it's just it's colossal bullshit, and it's it's sanity straining. It's unethical to be uh, destroying the reputations of specific people who won't echo these new pieties, um, and it's um, it's just it's madness. And it, but but the problem is the only the only effective and it's thus far you know not all that effective. But the the only effective retort to this kind of thing it has to come from black intellectuals, right? It's like a, a, a white guy like me saying this is just, it, again, we'll, we'll, we'll never convince anyone in the, the Vox camp, right? Because they, they're they practicing, I mean, they're filtering based on identity for every single conversation at this point. Uh, and they don't, they don't see the, the, the intellectual or moral errors they're making by doing that. Are you having conversations with people behind closed doors who are leaders at these sorts of institutions? I mean, you, you're at these dinner parties with with people uh, whose opinions matter in the in the public sphere. Are, are are you hearing people saying in private what they're not going to do or say publicly? Uh, yeah, yeah, and this is yeah face to face and by email. Yeah, there's been a lot of this over the years. Um, and it's, um, that's an enormous problem because again, it gives a, a, a sense of a false consensus or, or a false sense of consensus, um, to everyone else. I mean, people think they're alone and they're not. And, um, you know, what we have here is a, a very perverse and dangerous emperor's new clothes phenomenon where no one will, will admit the obvious even when it really matters. I mean, they, and there are people whose reputations have been destroyed where it's just, it's absolutely obvious they're not, they're, they're the wrong, they were the wrong target, right? You know, the, this is not a racist. This is not a transphobe. This is not a misogynist. This is not, and yet they're being hurled from the ramparts by a mob. Uh, uh, and, you know, often, the the cancellation is being affected from within an organization where you know some you know the 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 CEO of Netflix has to agree that this person should be fired right and the, otherwise they wouldn't be fired but it's just obvious the person isn't racist what is that about why can't they just are they just afraid, like we're going to sacrifice one person to save our ass the more broadly like what what's the psychology or what's the fear like what do you make of it well, so certain organizations are are in thrall to their woke employees, right? They have a they have an, enough of a, a woke employee base that they feel like, all right, we just have to sacrifice. We got to throw this guy overboard because you know we just had two thousand people sign a petition that, that they don't want to work with them, right? So that, that seems like a a fire that has to be put out, and it's pretty easy to to put it out. You just acquiesce to their demands. You know, you have two thousand employees demanding that uh, Antonio Garcia Martinez be fired because he wrote a, a best-selling book a few years ago that said something that they're construing as misogynistic in it. Oh yes, which they knew about full well when he was hired. Yeah, yeah, and so, but so, the, and, and these two thousand employees who signed this list almost certainly had had never read the book. Um, they just saw a pull quote from it, but it's just you know, the, yes, he was, the the um, uh, the powers that be felt like, oh, it's just easy to acquiesce here. So they did. And then they get a, a new letter, which says now Ac Apple should be taking a position against Israel in, the, in their conflict with the Palestinians, right? Like it, it, it's, it's not going to stop. Um, but it's um, people and corporations are highly risk averse, right? And there's just no, there's no incentive to uh, step out of line when the the consequences can be that painful right there's no individual incentive to say hey listen guys it's um you know everything you think you know about the cops and violence is wrong you know when you have people literally weeping over the footage they just saw of george floyd being killed right so it's like 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 that's 
it, it never get it never gets truly easy to do that, uh, even though many people can recognize that they they're being swept up into a a kind of public hysteria and moral panic. Um, it's just it's a coordination problem. It, it, what is what would be solvable if we all did it together becomes completely irrational and self-sacrificing for one person to attempt to do on his or her own, right? If you are the person who's going to step forward and you, and no one else does, well, then you can be the next, you know, you have the pleasure of being the next Salman Rushdie, right? You, know, you want to go into hiding for 10 years because everyone thinks you're, you know, a grand dragon of the Ku Klux Klan or, you know, some, mm-hmm. you know, whatever the topic that's is, a, that's you're a transphobe. An, that's an interesting analogy though, because I mean, Salman Rushdie, obviously his life was in danger, but this, to be canceled by your own side uh, does a, a degree of damage that, uh, you know, if, if, to be canceled, I, I'm not really comparing anybody to Salman Rushdie's situation, but I think people sometimes underestimate the degree to which being canceled by the other side isn't even really a cancellation. It's It increases your currency, right? So it's it's people fearing their their own side. I just, like, is there... Is there a world in which everybody could just do this at once? Do you have any hope? Like, do you do you see this still going on five years from now, ten years from now? Um, I can't imagine it going on to this degree. I, I think the spell will have to break. Uh, you know, I, I'm more. What I'm worried is that. Uh, what I'm really worried about is that there's a there's a self fulfilling prophecy part of this or possibility here that would be genuinely bad to to accomplish uh which is to say that all of these allegations of racism I mean, to to take one variable I and mean, it's, it's not it's not we we've been focused on racism because it's just easy shorthand and it's 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 taking up most of the oxygen here but it this also relates to me too it also relates to the trans issue right so um but I mean, to take race as as one part of this um these endless allegations of racism, you know, finding racism even where it, it manifestly doesn't exist, um, I think could have the consequence of really harming race relations in this country and make and essentially making uh, manufacturing more racists for us, right? You know, and or at least making people callous to the the problem of racism insofar as it still does exist right and and making people callous to the very real problem of in social inequality that is highly correlated with race right i mean that's I mean, you know i've been for all this time uh, i've been criticizing the lunacy on the left i've also been worrying out loud about the problem of wealth inequality and uh, i mean there, there are other Sorts of inequality. There's, but you know, so much of it is is anchored to to the the problem of of, um, of class, essentially. Uh, and wealth inequality is yes. There's a, a a significant correlation with race. I mean, there's just there's you know, it's something like um, eight to one or ten to one the the disparity in in wealth between the the white and black community, right? So it's it's enormous. And that, that's having enormous consequences, uh, as you'd expect. And I really think we have to remedy that. Uh, and I really want new norms, political, political, and and ethical norms, to form around how we think about inequality and how we how capitalism can be um, uh, revised ultimately. Yeah, I was going to say. Be, to, can we do this ethical. through capitalism? Yeah. I yeah. Mean, I, mean, I think I think yeah. capitalism is the best system we've got to to produce wealth. But so you know, I'm not a a I'm certainly not a communist, and I'm and I'm not even a socialist. But I do think that we just have to picture what success will look like for us if we really get our act together and all of the the trends toward automation proceed to some happy terminus where you know we basically have canceled the the um the role of drudgery in our lives i mean no one need ever do a boring and dangerous job again because we now have robots to do those jobs what does the world look like well it, it should look like 
a situation where we have figured out how to spread that abundance around so that that uh, life has gotten better and better and better for everyone right now. And whatever inequality we have is on top of a, a really acceptable, you know, uh, social safety net right now. You can call that socialism, but I, I don't really... I don't really think of it in those terms. And anyway, it would be it would be very you know you know I was uh, I mean, at, the, at the very least open minded about universal basic income and um, you know I, I th- there there's a real problem of inequality that we have to solve and we cannot live in a world where we have a few trillionaires and forty percent unemployment and uh, you know people you know you know living in tents in our in our wealthiest cities right so it's it's um there's a there's nothing I'm saying that should be construed as as a lack of awareness of the around the problem of of inequality, or how that that problem interacts with the variable of race. But um, I'm worried that all of this all of this dishonesty and hysteria and um, hypocrisy and bad faith will make people just um, no longer care about real problems, you know, and real, real, uh, truly unconscionable disparities in, in luck in our, in our society. Um, so yeah, I, I, I do see many people just tuning out and saying, these people, you can't talk to these people. They're totally dishonest. Uh, I'm done, right. I'm just going to live. I'm, you know, I, I've got, I've got a great life. You know, I live in wherever Newport beach or Miami or, you know, the Upper East side. And I'm going to, I'm going to try to live my life so that I don't have to deal with these problems. Right. Like I'm just going to keep the homelessness out of my backyard and, um, you know, keep the crime down. And I'm done thinking about this because everyone who's telling me that this is a five alarm fire has been lying. Uh, and that includes the New York times and uh npr and 60 minutes and everyone else i used to trust uh, to tell me what was going on in the world and is this a a matter of of algorithms as much as anything because i don't think it it would be dishonest to sit here and say that you know the social justice activists i don't like to call them sjw's uh, social justice warriors but it, it would be it would be wrong to say that people in that space don't care about income inequality. I think they they care about it a lot, but do you get the sense that there's just a, a feeling, a perception in that sphere that it's easier to talk about racism? It's just sort of a cleaner shot. Uh, and then if we kind of solve that, then then we can move on to income inequality. Is is it just is it just a simpler thing to have memes about and to talk about and to kind of have the algorithm do its thing and and reach more people. Well, yeah, I think many people are just confused, and, and many people are um, attached to this religious precept that it has to be about identity and race, right? And then if you put it in terms of inequality, um, you're, uh, you're you're just not interacting with the, with the the sacred variable that they care mm-hmm. about. Right. I mean, we, we, the, the, we're dealing with conceptions of something like original sin. You know, I mean, we, like when you're talking about the, the problem of whiteness or white fragility or um, it's just there, there's a um, this it's just it's not it's not a bad analogy. I mean, the analogy to religion or the analogy to a cult is um, is is just fairly literal you know, yeah it, it is you know, it has so, the same i hate dynamics. to do it i hate to do it because it yeah. seems like such a such low-hanging fruit but uh there really is no other way of looking at it that i can find most yeah, days yeah but they you know they, they obviously they do care about inequality i mean that's that is the that is in fact what what is real in many cases for them to care about uh and when and when they're um and again, there's there is a, a significant interaction between race and inequality here. So, you know, like if you, if you if you could convince yourself that what you really care about is inequality, right? Inequality with respect to wealth and income and access to healthcare and health outcomes and 
um, you know, environmental inequality, you know, exposure to to pollutants um, in certain neighborhood neighborhoods versus others, and I mean, just you make that list as long as you want, and then you want to, you started to to respond to those problems and um, uh, help people who were actually on the, you know, the on the the wrong end of a bad you know dice roll. Um, you would disproportionately be helping black people and people of color in our mm-hmm. society, right? And that was so you you would be saw and and in each case, your the solution would be targeted to someone who, by definition, should be helped, right? I mean, this is someone who's who you know, because because inequality is the is the right. issue here, right? But you know, and you're not going to be worried about whether um, you know. Uh, Jamie Foxx is black or white, you know, it's like, I mean, Jamie Foxx is doing fine. You know, he's, he's doing, he, he's doing better than almost anyone has ever done in human history. Right. And he is, you know, he's as, as ta- he's more talented than almost anyone in our society. Right. And he's ma- making the most of those talents. And, and uh, it's just, it's, it's a story. It's a story of absolute success. How much time do we have to spend worrying about the legacy of racism in the case of Jamie Foxx, right? It's just, it's just, it would be, you know, I have, you know, I haven't spoken to him about this, but, you know, and, and perhaps in the current environment, he would have a whole story to tell about how even he is, is uh, under the shadow of this thing. But the, insofar as we can touch any kind of objective measure of well being and success, and and good luck versus bad luck in our world. Jamie Foxx is on the on the fortunate side of basically every possible trade, um, and uh, you know which is great. So good for him. But it's not the it, it doesn't fit into a story of uh, you know Hollywood is so racist, right? Um, Do you think that? people are getting from this what people once got from religion? I'm sure this is a question you've been asked before, but I, I think it's it's still worth asking. Like, there is some kind of dopamine hit. There is some kind of visceral uh, experience that people are having when they start thinking this way and they start just kind of either self-flagellating or reckoning or just taking inventory, taking a moral inventory. Do you think that this kind of phenomenon could have arisen in a time when there was just more organized religion? Yeah, no, I I think this is, you know, religion is not a bulwark against it because religion shares, um, I mean, this is, this is a kind of new religion. I mean, you know, this is a religion without the supernatural. So it's without the trans transcendence in any kind of contemplative or mystical sense, but it, it does have a kind of, it, it offers the same transcendence that the, that fusion with a mob has always offered. Right. And, you know, it, it shares, uh, a lot with, um, you know, kind of the fanaticism of, uh, any kind of crowd behavior. I mean, the fanaticism of, you know, soccer hooligans, right? Like how do, how do you explain the fact that in the aftermath of a victory or a loss in the world cup, or, you know, as, as just happened in the, the, you know, the European cup, um, you can get totally normal people to behave like, you know, absolute sociopaths, um, on mass, uh, because a, a goal got scored or didn't get scored. Right. I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's a it's crazy crowd mm-hmm. behavior. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's it's being facilitated by social media. I mean that that part is genuinely new. Uh, so there's a kind of performative aspect to this that we're um, the consequences of which we're only now discovering. Right. So it's 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 a very unnatural situation to be able to um, from the the safety of your your parents' basement to be able to talk to a crowd it to, talk to you know to, to single out a a specific victim in front of a crowd and you know engage the the drama of all of that and to you know to join others in doing that uh and to do it anonymously in in, in on twitter for instance um 
it's just you know that's that seems to be maximizing this this um this appetite we have for witch burnings and and just the spectacle of of a you know not a, in this in most cases not a real murder but a a reputational murder mm-hmm. you know and 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 no one you know virtually no one is truly immune to this i mean it, it's instructive to watch the cases that were kind of right on the cusp of of cancellation i mean somebody like um jk rowling right like she if she had not been jk rowling i'm pretty sure she would have been canceled over her skirmish with the the trans community if she'd right? been a mid-list author yeah saying. yeah yeah i mean it's like her next book would not have been published uh, and i mean you know, and some perspective here i mean jk rowling is you know not my kind of new york times bestseller i mean she's they, they literally open theme parks to make money off of her intellectual property um it's uh you know they're you can count on one hand the number of authors who have her kind of stature with respect to the business of 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 books. Uh, so she should be, you know, utterly immune. I mean, she's on another planet, and I, you know, she wasn't immune. She just she's weathered it. I you know I don't know her personally. Um, I'd be surprised to learn if she's suffered any actual career damage, but. Um, it's you know when you have the the actors who starred in the movies derivative of your work i know you know at the actors who in most cases owe every owe their entire careers, their careers to, to their participation yes. in in your ip uh lining up to disavow their association with you publicly um it's uh you know that's quite a moment and it you know and so, so it's most authors would not have survived anything like that this is Watkins welcome with Bridget Pettisy i love hearing people's stories of resilience and grit this is why i created this podcast we are very excited to welcome jim gaffigan yasmin mohammed glenn beck tim dillon abigail schreier jeff garland ayan hirsi ali sam harris heather hying Jonah Goldberg, Ben Shapiro, Glenn Greenwald, Sarah Shahi, Colin Quinn. If there's a culture of victimhood, then let's tell stories of grit and survival. Subscribe and listen now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. I mean, just to kind of uh, circle back to, to, to what we were talking about at the top as we wind things down here, you know, this, again, to this, if, if the theme is you know, do we ruin the dinner party? I, I think there's a there's like a media version of this too, and I think a lot of what we've been talking about here has to do with um, a, a perception among again editors, television news producers, whatever it is, that the public somehow is not able to metabolize complexity. Uh, so we, we we can't take any risks if we want to um, you know stay on the right side of things and and be be you know release some kind of coherent message we have to just avoid talking about certain things and i you know i'm curious if you think that that is sometimes true you know i was i was struck by you know somebody like brett weinstein we've talked about the weinsteins a lot in this conversation but you know he was on tucker carlson uh fairly recently talking about vaccines and you know, he's making a, he's making a nuanced point. He's talking about how the fact that the vaccine is imperfect and can therefore allow a few breakthrough cases that will then further the outbreak. That is a point about the coronavirus vaccine that strikes me as something worth thinking about. But the question is, is it only worth, is it mostly worth thinking about in a classroom or a medical conference as opposed to on Tucker Carlson, where it's subject to mass interpretation. I, I'm really, I'm conflicted about that. Like, I, I'm here banging the drum of nuance, <laughs> but I'm also saying, choose your moments. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I don't agree with what Brett has been doing on vaccines. Uh, I, I think, I mean, this is, a, this is a very specific context. We have a public health emergency, you know, globally speaking. And um, 
we have to figure out how to respond to it in an environment where we know there's considerable vaccine hesitancy and disinformation. I mean, there's a fair amount of misinformation, but there's also a lot of disinformation, right? There's the, the, the intentional spreading of lies about vaccines. Um, and people are dying as a result and new variants of the, of the virus are being continually spun up in the population that is unvaccinated. Uh, and it's just a matter of time before one of these variants begins to blow through the vaccines, right? So it's like the people who are not vaccinated are not just problems for themselves. They're problems for everyone else too. So to be, to be sounding off in this context about um, how reasonable it might be to be vaccine hesitant, right? When it's actually not very reasonable, you know, even, I mean, it's like his, his arguments are, are wrong, right? It's just, I mean, I mean to, to put it simply here, there really, there, there really only two paths in this, in this garden of possibilities. There's, there's the, the path of, you're going to be exposed to the coronavirus uh, uh, with a vaccine or without a vaccine, right? I mean, like that's it's like it's just it forks there. It's like you're eventually you're going to be exposed to the coronavirus if you're living anything like a normal life. Uh, so the question is, do you want to be vaccinated before that happens? And now vaccines are 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 everywhere available. Um, now, it, it vaccines any any vaccine. And any other medical procedure or, or medication carries with it some risk, which is to say that if you give it to tens of millions of people, there will be some number of people who have some terrible experience associated with that vaccine or intervention. This is true for literally everything we do. You know, it's, it's true for Advil. It's true for Tylenol. It's true for antihistamines. It's you know, it's true for foods. You know, if you feed start feeding peanut butter to people, some number of people are going to die outright by being exposed to peanut butter. So, you know, quite, how big of a peanut butter problem do we have and, and should we outlaw it, right? And if peanut butter gave 95% protection against coronavirus, you know, would you be recommending that people get, you know, have a peanut butter sandwich immediately? Yes, you would. Um, so um, the, the, it really is just a choice between between being exposed to this virus with or without a vaccine and um bread is acting like the the vaccine is more dangerous than than covid uh, getting covid without without having the immunity conferred by the vaccine and we just know that's not the case i mean we, we've we've run one of the largest ex experiments ever on this on this front we've we have uh, you know, something like a hundred million people at least who've gotten coronavirus without the benefit of a vaccine, and you know, six hundred thousand of those people died, right? And then we have something like a hundred million people, you know, or more who have gotten the vaccine. How many people have died due to getting the vaccine? Um, I'm not sure anyone has, but yeah. it's, it's, it's certainly not six hundred thousand. Is he making? I maybe I'm misunderstanding. I, is he actually? saying i mean we don't have to dwell on this but is he mm -hmm. saying that people that it is actually on some level unsafe to take the vaccine or yeah. is he just kind of because I, I was interpreting this as a kind of thought experiment that no he no was, he's he's okay, been saying okay. he's been saying that the vaccine is as yet i mean there's some evidence that it it damages the blood brain barrier i believe he said that uh, based on one um study and uh but of course we have to compare that to what covid does to the blood brain barrier when in someone who hasn't been vaccinated um and he's just he's he's you know he he says he's not anti-vax so, and that's fine i'm sure he's gotten other vaccines but he's definitely concerned about this being you know in, in particular the mrna vaccines being new um and as yet you know in terms of long-term data we by definition don't have any so you know, he's worried, as any rational person might be worried. Who knows what this is going to do to us in the fullness of time? You know, is it possible that twenty years from now we'll recognize that that this spike protein that the the vaccine generated in us um, was harmful? 
Well, yes, that, that's that's a possibility. But what we know now is that getting COVID is worse, right? As witnessed by the body bags that you know that are, that are accruing on one side of this experiment, and get the, the vaccine isn't killing people, and the vaccine is as effective uh, in preventing severe disease as we could uh, as as we could possibly hope uh, at this point. And this is a, we're in the middle of this crisis, which is not going to stop until we get a sufficient number of people vaccinated or otherwise uh, immune. Um, and then he has a whole, you know, uh, thesis about how ivermectin is, is actually a good prophylactic against COVID. And, right. I was and, kind of persuaded yeah. by that, I, I have to say, was I, uh, did I get well, it's just, you know, in? Uh, I mean, the, the, the evidence for that is at be best, uh, uns, you know, less than fully substantiated at this point. But there's, you know, as far as I can tell, there is no evidence that it is a prophylactic on the order of one of these vaccines, right? It's just- Oh, but what that, about as a therapy? Sorry, we don't need to, this is, we don't yeah. need to turn this well, into no, a medical but, discussion. But, but, anyway, but, yeah. but this just goes to the fact that it's like, this is, the, the reason not to get on television and and open up this can of worms is because you can know in advance that it is it is um interacting with a an ambient level of vaccine fear that uh is posing a a, a real problem for you know just kind of group behavior and and public health messaging right it's just like w w vaccine hesitancy is a thing that has been harming us for for many many years and it's it's especially bad now given the current crisis and it's it's um so it just seems like like unless unless the data on ivermectin were you know uh, just amazingly persuasive right and and it, it and a real counterpoint to the to the um, the remedy on offer um there's just no real. There's no reason to pick this particular battle, right? It's like, well, why would you be be speculating about this kind of stuff and sowing doubt when um, the the real thing, the, the the thing that differentiates America at this moment from so much of the rest of the world is we have access to these vaccines, right? That's I mean, we're incredibly lucky, and um, you know, he's treating it like this is no, we're actually this is a an instance of self harm now that is, um, you know, it's its own moral emergency that has to be responded to. But is there a, a way that this topic could be talked about where it was like a yes and, like get the vaccine, and there's some evidence that ivermectin might help in early stages of illness, and it's probably not going to hurt you. So physicians should be, a, you know, get the memo and, and know about this. Yeah, I mean, th this is I mean, first. I mean, in you know, in Brett's defense, let, let me acknowledge that there have been so many missteps and pratfalls in our public health messaging in the last fifteen months that it's you know the, the trust in in institutions has broken down. I mean, th th this is this is what and and broken down for in many cases good reasons. I mean, the whole lab leak thing, you know, being treated as a as you know, essentially racist pornography because Trump had been talking about it. Um, you know, it, it was obvious from the beginning that that was a plausible thesis, right? And it's to be. I mean, this is this is this is the problem with political correctness and and identity politics and and just, just having politics um, as the lens through which you you talk about objective reality. In this case, epidemiology. It makes it impossible, right? So, so it's. I mean, the the reason why I didn't focus on the lab leak hypothesis twelve or or fifteen months ago is because it was irrelevant, right? It's not. The, it was never because it was implausible. It was just who cares? We we sequenced this genome in something like eleven days. Now we know what we have to vaccinate against. Let's just solve this problem. It doesn't matter where this came from. You know, we'll we'll deal with the Chinese later. We we know something's wrong over there. Either they have to close down those wet markets or they have to get their labs under control. Uh, it was never plausible to think that someone consciously released this 
you know, in order to to kill everyone, because you know, why would you release it on your own city first? Um, so, uh, but it's just you have to have your priorities straight. I mean, what is what's important to talk about now? And um, uh, and so, yeah, I mean, that's that's where we differ. But it, it is the breakdown of trust in institutions, institutions like the CDC, you know, or or the New York Times. Um, that is that's something that is uh, genuinely seems new or the degree to which it's happened seems new and it's a, it's an enormous problem because it it just makes it I mean that, then we just have a bunch of podcasts uh telling people what their worldview should be and whether or not they should get vaccinated right? like it, it's just it, that podcasts and substack newsletters are not um uh, an adequate uh, alternative to having a functioning government and having functioning, uh, 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 you know, journalistic media companies, right? We need a bureau overseas that can report facts, right? It can't just be somebody holds up an iPhone and says, "Here's what here's what I just uh, captured from my street. Look look what the cops are doing." Yeah, we've we've crowdsourced reality. Yeah, in a certain yeah. sense. But it's like, I mean, getting back to this throughout the pandemic, we had any number of officials come and get on TV and refuse to open up a can of worms. But as a result, there was the every can remained sealed. Like, how, how do you well, but the, thread the, the needle the, the there? The concession to make it like people people need a a mature understanding of probability and statistics they, 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 they need to know how to consume data i mean so so like anthony fauci i would agree has been mediocre at best in his messaging on this and people like redfield were just catastrophically bad and i mean and and deborah burks was also terrible right so the the capture of you know, the the prominent public health officials by politics and by you know, not wanting to offend the president in in the case of Burks and and Redfield, um, it was that was all disastrous. But you you could you still can talk about these things in public, but you you would just strike. I mean, you you would strike the note that I'm attempting to strike here, which is yes, everything has risk, and if you're going to you know if 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 you're going to have tens and and hundreds of millions of people exposed to something. You will always find a terrifying story of a complication that happened to five people or 50 people or in, in some cases, 500 people. Uh, and again, you would have that with peanut butter, right? So, um, and it's, it's, it's like, how, how do we talk about plane crashes and your attitude toward getting on an airplane in the immediate aftermath of a plane crash? Well, there's a way to do that. But we don't, and there's a and there's a way to do that badly, and we could do that so badly that we could have people, we could destroy the airline industry, and we could have people saying, "I'm never getting on a plane again," right? We could have basically, you know, it's, it's sort of what happened after the, the movie Jaws came out. You know, you had you had a generation of people who just did not want to get into the ocean ever again. Um, and is that right? Really? I mean, this, yeah. I mean, that, there... you know, I don't, I don't know. I'm, I'm probably exaggerating. I was the, the 70s. The size of the was attack. afraid of quicksand and sharks. Right. Yeah, quicksand. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where is all the quicksand? I remember Just, as a I, kid we, thinking we quicksand. Yeah. We socially engineered quicksand out yeah. of society. Yeah. Quicksand was that was a a, a legitimate way to way to go. <laughs> um, but yeah, so it's just we we know that there are good and bad ways to assimilate data and to, we know you know what can drive our intuitions can be um uh, pretty irrational and um we have to f- figure out how to correct for that and you know so i, I don't again I, I have not gone completely down the rabbit hole i haven't spent eight hours listening to what he said on this topic but i've spent i've spent at least an hour on it and and to my to my ear he's not striking the notes i would want to strike about you know, vaccines, their safety, their, their possible dangers, and the, uh, the possibility that, that ivermectin can be taken as a prophylactic instead of getting vaccinated. Okay. 
Well, Sam, I've, I've kept you for a long time. Um, sure. Just, well, uh, it's been a pleasure. Well, just, you know, a kind of final question here. You know, I wonder if you have any thoughts. I mean, on, on this this thing I think about a lot. I mean, people often, I think, accuse people like us of harping on the idea of honest conversations, you know, just just for the sake of talking, as if we want to kind of, you know, as if we want to sit around and talk about cancel culture all day or whatever it is. But, you know, my argument is that there are, in fact, practical matters, urgent issues even that, you know, we have a society, as a society been wrestling with for a long time, but can only be addressed through kind of innovative, imaginative solutions that, in fact, require these kinds of conversations that are often rendered taboo. I mean, I have a couple of, of you know, a couple of examples in mind myself, but I'm, I'm wondering for you, like, what are the biggest problems that you think cannot be solved unless we can wander into some uncomfortable terrain? Well, so I'm never talking about these things just for the hell of it. It's really, I, I tend to focus on things that I think have, um, I mean, there, there, there are times where I, I'll do a podcast on something that's just purely a matter of intellectual interest, right? You know, talking about the, you know, talking about physics or the nature of consciousness or whatever it is. And then there are other things you know, in, 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 on the terrain that, you know, we've been covering where I'm focusing on them. Be, not because they're interesting, because many of them are deadly boring, uh, but because they're they're hugely consequential, and in many cases the, those consequences are not being acknowledged. And what you know, they're, they're, I think this this issue of what's happening on, on the far left and its capture of of um, most of our institutions, um, it's consequential for two reasons. One is it's, it's creating a tremendous amount of obvious harm. Um, but perhaps even more than that, it's, it represents a, uh, an intolerable and ongoing opportunity cost. I mean, it's like, look at all of the things we're not talking about and all of the problems we can't figure out how to solve because this way of speaking and thinking and, and reacting and emoting is blocking everything else. Right. So it, it's just, it's, um, so what are, what are some of those things just off the top? Well, of your I mean, head? we, you know, if we should be talk, we, we really should be talking about inequality and what to do about it. And we should be doing that in a way that is not, um, needlessly polarizing and, um, and tribalizing. Right. Um, we should be talking about the, the, the real sources of the most needless suffering in our world, right? I mean, so we should be responding to real suffering insofar as it exists and real risk of, of suffering and harm insofar as it really looms. So should we, we should be thinking about things that pose existential risk to us that can, could just screw up the whole human project, you know, the, 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 the ongoing threat of nuclear war something we do not think about enough it, it almost it is almost certainly the most likely way we can still end it all for ourselves but you know by by intent or by accident um we should be t we should you know the, the pandemic should have inspired us to spend a lot more time thinking about um p pandemics both both natural and manufactured uh you know that's an enormous problem that's not going away and we should be uh, just putting immense resources toward toward detection and um kind of the speed of our response and if anything is is especially depressing out of our experience during covid is it's um you know we're we're really bad at this i mean this was a dress rehearsal for something quite a bit worse and we failed it, it just categorically i mean the only thing that the, the only success here is how quickly we produced these vaccines that brett weinstein doesn't want to take right um so i mean that, and that that has been a genuine success but and it's trump just, is going to get credit for it by the way it does you know it do, doesn't matter it's just uh, it doesn't matter who gets credit it's just we we we, we want to be able to do this and we want to be able to do this faster than we did it and if any, if there's any, if there's a glimmer of hope here, it's that we we have our game together on the on the uh, 
the, the molecular biology front enough that we will be able to do this faster and faster. And hopefully that will that will um, also be a story of being able to to detect these things faster and faster. But it, but our our inability to cooperate with one another politically. I mean, both you know in, internationally, you know, you know, the U.S. and the Chinese. Um, uh, but you know, just domestically, uh, especially the fact that this became so tribalized, and you know, mirror mask wearing became a a um, uh, a shattering uh, variable in our society. Uh, it's just it's it do, it does not suggest that we're going to get our arms around many of these other major problems. I mean, it suggests to me that that a political response to climate change is impossible. Right, we will we will never convince the people we need to convince uh, to do anything, to make any sacrifice with respect to climate change, or to do anything differently. You know, just that's that path is not open to us. I mean, that, that's the that's the conclusion I draw from COVID. Um, it's not to say that there's no path open to us, but it can't be the one of political persuasion. Uh, we will we will solve the problem of climate change, despite the fact that. You know, something like half of our society cannot be convinced that it's even a problem, right? And the the way to do that is to have the five thousand people who whose opinions actually matter just decide to ram through the policies that will actually make a difference. And on the other side, to to make the technological changes that we want to make anyway, that that actually produce the products that people will really want to buy anyway. That just happen to be more in line with with a a um, uh, an environmentally sane future, right? So we, you know, once we build electric cars that are cheap enough uh, that everyone can recognize that they're just better than gas powered cars, well, then people will buy them not because they're solving the problem of climate change, but because they actually would rather have an electric car because it's just better. Um, that's uh, so that's that's the way we're going to do this. But I have absolutely no hope that we can we can get people to respond uh, appropriately to data with a much slower moving emergency than COVID was uh, in, in the case of climate change. But that's the kind of thing we we need to be focused on. I mean, generally speaking, we need to focus on the ways in which bad incentives are causing people uh, and causing all of us collectively to. Um, uh, maintain our our collision course with all of the the uh the hard objects that await us in the future you know i mean just how many icebergs do we want to to try to ricochet off of um before we experiencing before we experience anything like you know truly open water and and smooth sailing um it, i feel like those open waters are in view i really I mean, like we can we can obviously get past racism and race as a variable in our society we're so close to doing that the people who have the people who are successful are really successful have already done it right i mean it's just it's it's not a factor it, what do you mean it, by that actually what say what do you mean people well, who it's have, just i mean the, the people who are the, the people who are thriving you know I mean, again this speaks to the issue of inequality but when you're when you're when you're wealthy and educated and uh, you can spend a lot of your time just enjoying what other creative people do and you can enjoy your own creative engagement with the world, right? I mean, when you're, when you're among the very lucky people who are just, who are just living in a world of ideas and I mean, who, you know, who are, who are getting all the good parts of cosmopolitanism without any of the bad. Right. Who, you know, it just who, you know, who, when, when you when you were when you were free to be a student of history and a student of 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 many cultures uh, and um, and you you get the benefits of travel and uh, globalization without, you know, having your livelihood outsourced to China and, you know, watching your 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 town destroyed because all the factories closed. Right. Like you're just you, you've got the you've got the abundance without the the casualties. 
uh, of the of the kinds of changes that have happened in the last fifty years. Um, you you are living in a world where virtually all of what people are focused on now is no, is no longer a problem, right? And then the question is how how can we get the rest of society to enjoy that you know that frame of mind and the the actual its material requirements right because again inequality is is a a significant variable here and it may be the the master variable um so i'm not i'm not saying there are no rich racists in the world but um for the most part it, it's um it's just a, I mean, we're, the, we're living in very different worlds. You know, it's like, this is, that's one thing you just need to appreciate that you're, each of us is in a kind of echo chamber. And as, as much as you try to get out of it, um, it's, uh, it's hard to know what the, the person who's behaving like a, a, uh, madman out in the world. Um, it's hard to know it's it's hard to diagnose that situation without knowing what they're seeing based on their engagement with media and their peers and you know social media in particular i mean it's just like like how is something like qAnon even possible right i mean it's, it's just when you look at the details there when you look at the fact that people are willing to risk their lives uh and certainly their reputations in in um you know under the sway of the belief that you know Hillary Clinton is drinking the blood of babies. You know, I mean, it's just that's it's, it's it's almost impossible to persuade yourself that people actually believe yes, this, exactly. but it's in, in fact the case. You know, uh, so well, we're all uh, we're all listening to our own podcasts. It's, uh, right? it's, yeah. uh, but that, well, that's again that's that's one of the the real problems with the breakdown of of trust in institutions. And that, that's why it matters. I mean, when you ask, you know, why do we spend so much time whinging about wokeness? That's why it matters when the New York Times gets it wrong. And that's why it matters when Princeton has his head up its ass. Um, and that's why it matters when the CDC can't be trusted to just actually talk science, right? Um, because, you know, it's the, the difference between a real institution that has real integrity and and uh, um, all of the resources it needs to to drill down on on facts. And the difference between that and and you know Breitbart or something that's just you know obviously a confection of of political tribalism. That difference has to be maintained. Like we we need the we need a bulwark between the New York Times and Breitbart. Insofar as New York the New York Times begins to resemble Breitbart, but just the the leftist version of it, that's um you know that's a huge cost to all of us. I mean whether whether you read the Times or not, it's just it's a um we we can't um we can't give up that difference. And um, what we're what we're finding is that the people who are running those institutions are um. Or does it seem to be just happily tearing them down, uh, you know, thinking that they're doing um, the, the Lord's work. And it's, um, you know, that hence, hence our focus on, on them and not on, on uh, bigots with tiki torches. Right. No, it's, uh, it's crazy making. Well, Sam, thank you for all you do to cut through this. And I, you really, um, you play a really important role. So thanks for for doing your part and thank you for taking so much time with me i it's I, I really am very very grateful so yeah well happy to do it i love your work and uh, i wish you the you. best of luck with with the podcast thank you all right well to be continued someday i hope that was my interview with podcaster best-selling author neuroscientist philosopher and meditation teacher and practitioner sam harris you can find him and his podcast at samharris.org. You've been listening to the Unspeakable Podcast. As you may have noticed, this podcast now has advertisements here and there. If you'd like to get ad-free versions of the podcast, as well as early access to it, please support it at any level on the Patreon page at patreon.com slash the unspeakable. There are lots of other perks there too, including if you sign up at the $10 a month level or higher, 
$10 off your first purchase of official Unspeakable Podcast Nuanced AF merchandise. There are hats, mugs, thermoses, stickers, magnets, a baby onesie for that exceptionally nuanced infant in your life, You can find all of this in the Nuance store on the podcast website, theunspeakablepodcast.com. And if you're new to the show, that website will tell you lots of stuff you may want to know and make it very easy to listen to all of the interviews, nearly 50 by now, that I've done since the show launched a year ago. Though, of course, you can also do that on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. Finally, as you may have noticed, the show is now part of the Podcast One Network. That means that the last six weeks or so have been something of a whirlwind trying to make the transition over to Podcast One. And in light of that, I just want to take a a second to thank the team that's been helping me out from the beginning. Uh, This is a solo venture, but I do have editing and production help from the amazing people at Talking Silkworm podcast production firm. Specifically, David Perez, who runs the shop, and Mayra Ortega, who gets my editing notes week after week and does a beautiful job editing the audio, including all those unwanted barks from Hugo. I'd also like to give a shout out to Scott Schaefer, who does graphics and web design for me. I sometimes complain about how I'm all alone in this project, but the fact is I've got some really talented people helping me every week. Your Patreon support helps me continue to retain their services. So on behalf of all of us, thank you again for that. That's it for now. I'll be back next week with another super nuanced guest. Until then, thanks for listening. See you next time. Hi, I'm Frank. I don't like change. And I just saw a billboard for this new BJ's Wholesale Club talking about up to 25% off grocery store prices. Oh, really? What's wrong with paying full price, huh? No, sir. I would not join BJ's Wholesale Club. Let's agree to disagree, Frank. Say you do want to sign up now for amazing savings. Join the new BJ's Wholesale Club, opening soon in Ross Township. Visit BJ's.com slash Ross Township or the BJ's Membership Center at the Block Northway. Are you in excruciating pain brought on by your son, daughter, or spouse suffering from addiction? The sleepless nights, the constant worry, and the feelings of isolation. Recovery Centers of America wants you to know you're not alone. Addiction destroys families. But if you call Recovery Centers of America today at 1-888-RECOVERY, your loved one can begin to recover, and so can your whole family. At Recovery Centers of America at Monroeville, your loved one will be treated with compassion and dignity by expert addiction professionals while recovering in a world-class facility. Family Support Services will give you knowledge, connection, and community so that you can begin to heal and recover as well. Call 1-888-RECOVERY today. Recovery Centers of America accepts insurance, provides transportation, and offers intervention services at no cost. Patients are admitted 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Call 1-888-RECOVERY now.